Hello and welcome to our webinar on environmental management for facilities managers. My name is David Inman and I've advised facilities managers across the world on environmental and energy and sustainability matters. And I'm here today to tell you about some of the key things you need to deliver as facilities managers to protect the environment and to deliver environmental management. Before we start, I'd just like to clarify that I'm not going to give any legal advice during this webinar. Anything that arises from you watching this webinar that may, legal advice, that may need legal advice, I recommend you seek advice from a qualified professional. Such as me, I advise facilities managers from client to contractor, from internal facilities management organisations to facilities management delivery bodies, from contract cleaners to maintenance companies to asbestos removal companies. So I've got a real good understanding and wide experience of facilities management. And also I deliver environmental management systems to facilities management organisations across Europe. ISO 14001 is the international standard for environmental management and it follows a simple rationale which is plan, do, check and act. Plan your work, do the work and check your work that you've met the plan afterwards. Many facilities managers that I work with are responsible within their organisations for ISO 14001 and that's really exciting and it's really challenging for the facilities management industry. You know, as facilities managers, you're at the lead with environmental management. And at the end of the day, ISO 14001 is about protecting the environment. So as facilities managers, I hope you're taking the lead in protecting your environments. When you're looking at your planned preventative maintenance regimes, there may be facilities or equipment that may pose a risk to the environment, whether it be heating, cooling, ventilation equipment. This equipment may use F-gas. You may manage waste management on your sites and you may also manage possible polluting substances such as cleaning chemicals or oil tanks. So when you're reviewing your PPMs, please make sure you understand your environmental risks within the infrastructure and equipment that you are managing. So look at the asset and look at the environmental risk of this asset. In terms of what is the environment, well, it's air, water, land, wildlife, the built and natural environments and human beings and it's the interaction between all of these that form what is commonly known as the environment. And it's your job as facilities managers to protect your environments and the environments in which you manage and the environments in which you care about. A challenge for all facilities managers is waste management. In many countries, there's quite a strict regulatory regime of legal compliance on waste management. I know I'm based in the UK and the UK waste regulations, there's quite a lot of them for a start, but they're also quite onerous and it's a very complicated area of practice. So be really careful when you're looking at compliance with your waste management but make sure your compliance is key with your waste management planning. Next, look at minimisation of waste in your workplaces. And an easy one for this is take away individual bins, individual waste bins from each desk. If you're looking at a waste bin at the end of a working day, what's in it? Probably nothing, a little bit of food waste, a little bit of packaging waste. So what I would do is take away all the desk side bins and put centralised bins in office and workspaces. That can also provide waste segregation between general waste and recycling waste. 
If you're looking at segregating waste that may go to landfill and may avoid landfill, I would always say for 90%, 90-90% waste diverted from landfill. For UK organisations, 90% of your waste not going to landfill as a minimum is very achievable with sensible and pragmatic and legally compliant waste management. Don't forget that the less waste you produce, the less it's going to cost you and your clients and the less you'll have to have waste charges in service charges. One little tip is that some waste management companies charge per lift, even though a bin, an external bin or a skip, may be empty. And they'll charge for it. So make sure your waste management orders in terms of the collections manage what you want because your waste management provider may be emptying empty skips into their lorry but that is classed as a full skip and may go towards your figures. Even by doing that organisations I've worked with have gone from a 35% diversion of waste from landfill and just by reorganising and re-rationalising the amount of skips on site have gone right up to 89% so the quick wins. Finally, also think about security of your premises twofold when it comes to waste management. The first one is fly tipping and unwanted deposits of waste on your premises. I know in the UK that if unwanted persons deposit waste onto commercial land, it's the commercial landlord or operator that's responsible for the removal and it can be quite expensive. So make sure your sites are secure and also make sure your bins and external bins and skips are secure also. It's, it's a sad thing, but people may be sleeping in your external bins. By locking them, it may exclude them from doing so. And it's for their safety. If somebody is asleep in your bin and the, the bin gets emptied into the mechanical wagon, it could result in loss of life or a very serious injury. So please, for everybody's safety and security, please make sure you lock your external bins. Next, we're going to look at water and two types of water. Clean water that you import into site and use on site and also waste water that you produce. Make sure you're familiar with the drainage systems on your site. Make sure you know which drains connect to the foul sewer and which drains may run off into water courses. You may want to colour code these drains and the common colour coding is blue for surface water drains and red for the foul sewer. So painting the lids of drainage gullies and inspection chambers can really help identify where your waste is. Your, your drains are. Next is trade discharge. If you have a sewage outlet on your premises you will need agreement between yourselves and the sewage provider and in the UK this is called a trade discharge consent. It's always really wise to get a copy of this and understand it because there may be limitations on this. And again have all your wastewater included in any drainage map or plan. Now in terms of drainage maps or plans it doesn't have to be a, a complicated engineering drawing but if it is fantastic it can be a sketch that you may want to investigate yourself. There's nothing wrong with you investigating your own drains and drawing a sketch plan. Unfortunately things sometimes go wrong and there may be a threat of water pollution so you may need emergency response arrangements on site and an emergency response plan. For this you may want to invest in using spill kits on site so if there is a material such as oil or fuel spilt you've got the equipment to safely clean it up and stop a pollution risk. If your site's invested in installing an oil interceptor please don't forget this interceptor will need maintaining from time to time and it may need cleaning out so please include that into your planned preventative maintenance regime.
a large financial outgoing for any commercial real estate is energy. And there's some really quick wins you can make with energy management. I really recommend you understand the controls of your energy management, whether it be via an electronic uh, building management system or a more manual system. So understand the temperature set points of your system and the times the system switches on or off. Don't forget, if the clocks change during the year, which they do in the UK to daylight saving time, the clocks change and your heating controls may be needed to change to suit. Also, changes in seasonal temperatures. Don't be frightened to change your heating set points and the time your heating switches on and switches off. And this includes cooling as well. Also, experiment with using less heating and cooling time. Maybe turn the heating and cooling off half an hour earlier before your workplace shuts. And if nobody notices, great, and try another half hour. But really try and do your zero cost quick wins. But set this as a formal policy and get top management's buy into it. Also, with your tenants and your building users, communicate that you have got a, a set point and a temperature control policy and show them how you apply it. And this hopefully will eradicate some of the complaints that people are too hot or too cold. Don't forget that you can't suit everybody in terms of thermal comfort. So by communicating that what your set points are, people will understand more that you are managing it. So think about the easy wins. However, if you decide to make capital investments in energy redu reducing equipment, such as new lighting or new HVAC equipment, seek professional advice from qualified engineers and get help from these people when they install the system into education you how to use it. There's some quite major hazards in HVAC systems and electrical systems, so please only use qualified professionals when carrying out any engineering tasks on your premises. Following nicely on from energy management, we're going to look at carbon management. And don't forget that carbon emissions for buildings is a calculation based on the energy that's consumed. As energy consumed, either via scope to emissions being produced at a power station elsewhere and you buy the energy in terms of electricity in, or scope one carbon emissions where you're producing energy on site from a fuel, such as a gas boiler. Don't forget that you can buy energy sources from a zero carbon source. So there's green electricity and there's even green gas. There's professional companies out there that can help you with the, the purchasing of this. But do your research and in the UK, every electricity company must publish the energy generation type for their electricity, whether it be nuclear, renewables, gas, coal, and this must be in a percentage clearly published and this is a legal requirement. Don't forget if you're doing any carbon calculations, I would always advise you use accurate data. We go back to the energy data and please make sure it's accurate. The best way to get this is directly from a meter and if the meter is read electronically, even better. Automatic meter readings give accurate data. If you're, meeting the re if you're reading the meter manually once a month, are you leaving exactly one month period between the meter readings? You may be reading it on different days, somebody may forget, somebody may be on holiday. So a little bit of investment in automatic meter reading will be really important and save you a lot of money and time if you're reading meters manually, especially if you've got multiple meter readings. Also a large producer of carbon dioxide and CO2 emissions is fluorinated gas. So if you've got F gas systems on your premises, make sure they're legally compliant. In the UK, there's a, a regimented legal framework for F gas. So make sure your engineers are competent if you're working in the UK, 
make sure they've got all the right records and make sure they're giving you the right records for the systems that you're responsible for in terms of FGAS. Don't forget with carbon management that if you do produce carbon calculations, they may be put into financial reporting. In the UK with the Streamline Energy and Carbon Reporting Scheme, carbon and energy data actually becomes part of financial reporting data. So you may have scrutiny of the energy uh, figures from accountants. So again, make sure you get the energy figures right first time so you can have accurate energy readings and you can also carry out accurate carbon calculations from these readings. We're now going to look at the contentious issue of parking on site. Many buildings do not have enough car parking. That's a fact. And you've got to remember that a lot of organisations, free car parking is a bonus to staff. And you don't have to supply free car parking. So car parking, remember, it's a benefit for staff and don't let them take it for granted. However, if you don't have enough car park spaces and you have to park elsewhere, please don't annoy your neighbours, whether they be residential or other businesses. It's bad publicity for your organisation. And also, if you have an emergency on site, so you need one of the emergency services, they may not be able to get to you. So if cars are double parked, a fire appliance may not be able to reach your premises. So just remember that. Promote car sharing. Allow dedicated car parking bays for people who car share. In Britain, there's even tax incentives for allowing people to claim money for being a passenger for car sharing on commercial travel. And that's not commuting, but on commercial travel. You can actually allow staff to claim mileage on being a passenger on commercial business journeys. If you're fortunate enough to be near public transport, promote the fact that there is public transport, where it is, where it goes, where it comes from, and the timetable. And that's quite easy to do on social media or via email in the office. And also tell your visitors that you're reachable via public transport. Do you need all visitors to be driving to you? when it's very easy to get to your premises via public transport. So just think about this and communicate if public transport is available, both to building users of your building and visitors. One final thing about vehicles is please avoid washing vehicles on your premises unless you've got dedicated professionally built vehicle washing facilities. The reason for this is twofold. The first one is that Contaminated soapy water may run into surface water drains and contaminate other, other water courses. And secondly, if you've got an oil separator on site, allowing soapy water with detergents into the oil separator will stop it working effectively. So whilst it may think, great, we've got an oil interceptor on site, please be very conscious about detergents including soapy water and runoff from car washes entering into that interceptor. So if you want to do any vehicle washing, do it off site. Use a car park, use a, a car wash, use a jet wash. Let somebody else take the risk. Uh, and it's, it's probably cheaper as well than providing facilities, car parking facilities, and running the risk of it becoming a pollution or affecting your oil separation infrastructure. If you're storing materials on site, just be aware that they may pose a pollution risk. And this materials can include oil, chemical, fuel, including in backup generators. So just be careful where you're storing it, what the infrastructure is like, where you're storing it. And most of all, do you really need to store it in the first place? If you can avoid storing polluting materials on your site, please do so. On the sites that you manage, there may be natural features and you may want to promote biodiversity on these features and on your sites. 
there may be in the country which you are working compliance issues so for example in the united kingdom nesting birds are protected in set months during the year from being disturbed so if you're carrying out any tree maintenance unless you're professionally and you've got a professional opinion of a qualified person you can guarantee that there's no nesting birds in those trees leave it leave the maintenance within for for outside of the bird nesting season there may also be invasive weeds on your property be aware of some of the legal regulations if they apply around allowing the spread of invasive weeds such as japanese knotweed but use your natural features as a benefit try and promote them think about not mowing areas of grass and letting wild flowers grow on them and these will attract insects and other small mammals but also brief your contractors on this don't forget you may not be carrying out your garden maintenance services yourselves so make sure your contractors know what legally any restrictions on them that they may have and also any biodiversity incentives you may want to use on site so it's not just about not mowing pieces of grass but it could also construct insect houses but try and increase the natural habitat on your site it's better for the whole environment globally and it's incredibly easy and sometimes it will actually save you money so if you're not mowing areas of grass that's going to save you money on grounds and gardens maintenance costs unfortunately sometimes things may go wrong on your site and you may have a pollution incident plan for this and plan a three-staged approach of stop work if it's safe to do so if an oil spill or similar event arises and if it's safe to do so stop any more material escaping secondly contain the material that's escaped and don't let it enter water courses or natural habitats and thirdly notify it notify it because it may have to be escalated to senior management but also notify it so you can learn from your mistakes and it not happen again check any incident response plan periodically and you can either do this physically while walking around site you can even do it as a desktop exercise Please have a look at our other webinar on spill response and I will put the link to that in the description below. And that's a, a specific webinar on planning for spill response and environmental emergencies. Implementing environmental management for your tenants or building users may cost money and you may want to represent this in a service charge. Now referring to the RICS practice statement, service charges in commercial property first edition, all expenditure must be recovered within the terms of the existing lease. And you mustn't reclaim more than 100% of the actual costs of whatever environmental benefits or improvements you make. So you can't make any money or any profit on implementing environmental controls you can only charge up to 100% of their actual costs and that's in the RICS practice statement thank you for watching our webinar don't forget that facilities management you are at the cutting edge of environmental management you are the people who make it happen on the ground and be proud of this be proud that you protect your working environment and the working environment of others also take it as a challenge to learn more about the subject and maybe in time explore implementing a formal env environmental management system to the ISO 14001 standard if you haven't already done so thanks very much for watching if you've liked this webinar please subscribe to our channel we regularly update property sustainability environment and business content to the channel which we hope you're going to find useful again thanks for watching and goodbye